spent the previous two years, uh, like any indie doc filmmaker, it took 10 years to make two docs, right? And both dealt with trauma, um, both dealt with a lot of sexual violence. And one of the things that I was struck by was that victims of severe trauma would uh, act out at some point in their life as a result of the trauma um, that had gone untreated. And then society at large or the people around them would only respond really to the thing that they did. And there was no, there was no sort of nuanced uh, care or, uh, or any sort of empathetic consideration of what the person had been through previously. And so that's kind of the way I guess look at stories. And then December 22nd, 2016, I'm scrolling through Facebook. I see a Huffington Post headline that says, Lorena Bobbitt is done being your punchline. And underneath it says something to the effect of, you know, how 23 years ago we missed an opportunity to have a national conversation about domestic violence, and instead it descended into a series of dick jokes. So I did the thing that you do when you, when you see a story that just that grabs you, uh, just going down the rabbit hole and, you know, then looking that, at the fact that Lorena's story would have been local folklore if it happened 10 years earlier in, you know, Manassas, Virginia. But it, it happened June 23rd, 1993, and it, ha it coincided with the birth of the 24-hour news cycle. And so virtually overnight, it's the biggest story on earth. Um, so that was really how it started. And uh, I reached out to Lorena. I sent her links to the films that I had made. And I just tried to express that I, I, I'm not like everybody else who has shown up with, at your door with a camera uh, in this last quarter century. Um, and uh, she very graciously uh, you know, opened the conversation and, and agreed to do it. Well, I have a lot of people contact me before and they always wanted to make a movie and they always have to, you know, come up with a story focusing on, on his organ instead of, you know, what really happened, what really mattered there, you know. And I said, well, this, this is going to be a critical issue. And if I'm going to have to do this, then yes, I will definitely do it. Um, and also, you know, see it through through the lens of the Me Too and, and also see through the eyes of, of men. And that was very powerful for me. If this incident happened 25 years later today, wh how do you think the media would react? The Me Too movement has uh, actually increased to, to break the stigma of talking about many victims and survivors now. And me, myself, as a survivor, I feel empowered by the Me Too movement to come and talk more about this situation. So it was very, I feel strong. I have a voice and I basically wanted to make awareness of, of this social epidemic. I mean, there's obviously an entire population in our country who took zero issue with Trump's Access Hollywood tape, right? So the same people who were, you know, thinking it was hilarious and, um, m you know, making fun of Lorena as opposed to understanding that she was the survivor of this, these horrors, they would be there, of course, but it would, it would probably be more balanced in terms of media coverage. You, both sides basically do have very loud voices now, and so you'd have the same shit that you had before, but you'd also have empathy that would probably equal the volume of, of that stuff, you know? It's funny, the first, the first six weeks that we were up and running, we did not get a response from a single person. And it was, you know, nowadays you, you're, you're making a doc wherever you're based, you're emailing, you're, you know, you're making phone calls, and generally you can get people on the phone or they'll respond to you. We had nothing. Um, and there was actually this part of me that was terrified that here we have this amazing opportunity um, and uh, Amazon is footing the bill and I'm actually not gonna uh, be able to interview anybody. <laughs> and, and so we, we made a decision uh, that I will uh, exclusively work this way actually moving forward, which was our researchers came with us on the road. And so while we were shooting during the day, trip number one was shooting Lorena's main interview and just some B-roll and different things around the town. Um, and while we were doing that, our researchers, uh, David Holthouse and Katie Ledane, they were, they were all over the Virginia, D.C., Maryland area, knocking on doors, meeting people at gas stations and diners, and just, you know, explaining in person that this is not yet another salacious Bobbitt treatment. Um, and, you know, one by one, we got 50 interviews. 
it was amazing the way people would would come alive obviously once we got going and were talking and just these weird little memories and fragments that they uh, just hadn't thought about in so long. And what, and what about getting access to John? Was he... Very easy. Oh, really? If you go on YouTube, um, you can see him doing an interview with somebody on what is probably, uh, no disrespect to Android, probably an Android phone um, in a park somewhere. Um, yeah, you know, it, it became clear that for him, unlike Lorena, who nobody ever heard from Lorena again, she did the work to, to heal herself. She went and found the life that she came to America dreaming that she would find. Um, she went and helped victims of domestic violence and just lived a quiet, normal life, which is really the most powerful outcome, I, I think, for your story. Um, you know, John, on the other hand, it was like, it was as if the scandal was the greatest thing ever to happen to him. When we were in his house uh, filming with him, you know, up on the TV screen playing off his laptop was clips from the trial. And you can see that he obsessively Googled and searched, you know, everything around the, this story. You know, it's interesting. You could tell that he didn't want filming to end. If I said, hey, can we hang here for six months? He would have definitely been on board with that. <laughs> um, but, you know, there is something from a cinematic standpoint that's like, you know, amazing about a villain, right? Um, and I do think he sort of instantly becomes like this classic documentary villain um, in this weird way. But what we have to remember and what I think the series does and what we feel like the series does is, no, this is a, this is a rapist. Um, and this is a person who abused um, not only Lorena, but several other women. And we found another victim of his who had never spoken up before. Um, who was tortured in ways that, uh, you know, I mean, I will not, it, it's not fit for this interview space, you know, but people will see it in, in the series. It's this weird thing where there's that goofy sort of hapless exterior, mm -hmm. but you know that um, the things that that person is capable of and the things that that person did, um, you know, they're, they're, they're beyond comprehension. I basically went through years of abuse and I didn't have any, I didn't know that there were shelters in my community that could help me to escape domestic violence. I thought I was the only one living domestic violence. And I didn't know there was a, you know, a problem that exists in this nation, the United States and around the world, um, that, that this is a very complicated, complicated and critical uh, problem that we have in our society. Um, and um, so I didn't have any choices and I was not educated enough. What was the moment for you where you kind of felt like, okay, this is actually going to work? Maybe them name dropping Get Out didn't help. <laughs> I mean, didn't, di didn't, didn't hurt either, you know what I mean? Um, usually I'm just some schmuck calling them up and they have to just, you know, on a wing and a prayer. Um, but then if you can say, no, there's this person whose work that you're aware of, who, who you probably love what they do is a part of this, um, People trust famous people. So Get Out was like really key to make it, to getting it made? I don't want to, I don't want to, I mean, in terms of... In terms of getting the interviews, in, in terms, terms of getting the interviews, there were a couple of times where um, that was the common ground that we that <laughs> push came to shove that you could find with somebody. Well, also, <laughs> um, Jordan Peele is very interested in social issues. Uh, and this was, you know, a very important part of, you know, for him to actually get in board with, with this social epidemic, the domestic violence. There was one moment, um, it was when we, we had shown him uh, rough cut one of all the episodes. He literally gave one note. He's not telling you that you have to do this. He's like, I'm, he's like, just think about it. And, you know, the note was essentially to structure the story the way I pitched it to him originally. Um, and as soon as he said that, everything clicked in a way that, uh, it, honestly, it would have taken months to get there otherwise. Um, so, good story brain, that guy. <laughs>